Thank you very much, Vahid, and thank you for this event. And it's good to be part of this event and to see so many outstanding people who've taken very courageous stands against the employment of nuclear weapons. I'm going to wait for Mr. Tanahari to uh, make some statements about the horrific experience he had as a child. So I'm going to try to keep from that. But I do want to say that clearly the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was uh, opposed by both the Eisenhower, General Eisenhower and MacArthur. They were enraged that such a thing had happened because it was not necessary. We were in the throes of surrender, Germany and, and uh, Japan. It just was not necessary. And especially a deliberate dropping of bombs on civilians, civilian areas. So when we talk about what the Russians have done with the Ukrainians and they drop uh, weapons on um, civilians at airports, at train, we've done that. We have set the standard and we must remember that there ought to be some deep sorrow in our hearts right now because there's a stain there, a stain. And you think about the children crying, those running for help, those running for water, uh, the cries, as, as Reverend Takamori would say, the children in the wounds vaporized, those ones outside the room vaporized. Um, mothers running with their children on their back, not knowing the children's head had been blown off. These kinds of things are atrocities that we must never, never, never forget. And we need to take the lead in terms of trying to build a world that is creative, peaceful, based on love. A, a nation that creates the culture of peace. And I've said that, and I've, so I'm taking some of my time because I found this wonderful reading um, about, Doc, about Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was president prior to the dropping of the bond because he became ill and died. And he said, the only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. Let us move forward with strength and active faith, with strong and active faith. It was April 1945, and now at last, the end of the war was in sight. The German armies were tottering. American and Russian troops were converging on Berlin from opposite directions. Japan, too, was losing ground. American forces had driven back the enemy on Okinawa with Japan, with Tokyo only 300 miles away. It would soon be over. Eagerly, President Roosevelt looked forward to the end of hostilities and to a world at peace again. It was his greatest wish to see a strong and enduring peace structure that would safeguard the world for generations to come from the scourge of war. He envisioned a world in which people everywhere could live without fear in peace and security, a world founded on fundamental human rights and freedoms. The president had recently returned from Yalta where he had conferred with Churchill and Stalin on plans for victory and peace. They had agreed to coordinate their military efforts for a swift and decisive victory. They had agreed to reorganize Poland to share the administration of Germany, to let the liberated countries create, quote, democratic institutions of their own choice, unquote. And most important for the future welfare of the world, they had agreed to support the United Nations, had led, had set the scene for an international conference in San Francisco to draw up a charter that would help ensure a lasting peace. Much had been accomplished at Yalta, but still much remained to be done. And the president was tired. The grueling burdens and problems of the war had taken their toll, and for some time now, he had been ailing. The 6,700-mile trip to the Crimea and the strenuous sessions of the conference had further sapped his waning strength. He felt worn out, drained of energy. For the past two weeks, he had been 
at this cottage in Warm Springs, resting and getting in shape for the meeting of the United Nations in San Francisco. He must be at his best for that meeting. The representative of 50 nations would be there and they would look to him for leadership. So much dependent on the success of the conference. It was the hope of hundreds of millions of people everywhere in the world. The promise of a lasting peace, a better and happier future for mankind. He tried to relax at Warm Springs to get as much rest as he could in preparation for the busy weekend. It was a perfect weather and he took long drives in the familiar countryside, enjoying the broad pine filled Georgia Valley, the budding trees, the fresh green promise of spring. He tanned a healthy brown in the outdoors. He took time to enjoy his stamp collections, to pose for his portrait and to visit and talk with old friends. But there was work to be done too. A small staff of associates had accompanied him to Warm Springs and a remarkable amount of activity went on in the little white pine cottage. The president was in constant communication with Washington and the world affairs. There were problems that weighed heavily on his mind and he gave them much time and thought. Daily, there were reports to read, documents to sign, letters and official papers to dictate. And as usual, there were speeches to think about and plan. Among them, a radio address to be given on April 13th in honor of the annual Jefferson Day dinner. The president completed his draft of the Jefferson Day address on Wednesday evening, April 11th. It had been an unusually pleasant and relaxing day, and he felt better than he had in some time. The war news had been very good this past week. He hoped for and soon expected a crushing Allied victory. Then there would be another conference with Churchill, perhaps in London, perhaps in Berlin. He picked up the brief address and read over what he had written. Americans are gathered together this evening in communities all over the country to pay tribute to the living memory of Thomas Jefferson. This was the first part of the speech eulogizing Jefferson, champion of liberty and defender of the rights of man. Today, this nation, which Jefferson helped to so greatly to build, is playing a tremendous part in the battle for the rights of man all over the world. He expressed his high hopes for the future his dream of a firm and lasting peace, of a better, happier life for all people everywhere in the world. We must conquer doubts and fears. We must cultivate the science of human relationships. He concluded the address with these characteristic words and inspiring message of faith and hope. Let me assure you, that my hand is the steadier for the work that is to be done. And I move more firmly into the task, knowing that you, millions and millions of you, are joined with me in the resolve to make this work endure. The work, my friends, is peace. More than an end of this war, an end to the beginning of all wars. Yes, an end forever to this impractical, unrealistic settlement of the differences between governments by the mass killings of people. Today, as we move against the terrible scourge of war, as we go forward toward the greatest contribution that any generation of human beings can make in this world, the contribution of lasting peace, I ask you to keep the faith. I measure the sound solid achievement that can be made at this time by the straight edge of your own confidence and resolve. And you, and to all Americans who dedicate themselves with us to the making of an abiding peace, I say, the only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. Let us move forward with courage, strong and active faith. These were the last words of Franklin Roosevelt, but she did not 
were not able to give because the next day the nation was stunned when they heard that the president was dead. So the Jefferson address was never delivered. That stilled his voice. The hope of an enduring peace. But his words remain eloquent and inspiring. I ask you to keep up your faith. Franklin D. Roosevelt did not live to say the end of final, the day of final victory, he did not live to see his dreams of world unity and a strong peace structure realized. For he never lost faith that out of the agony of war, a new and better world would be born. Faith in the future is part of the common faith of America and never has it been more unforgettably expressed than in these last words of Franklin D. Roosevelt. 